this time, I'd like to invite you up, sir. I'm making it a point not to turn this thing on until I get up here. I learned once. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, sometimes we don't always learn the way we should in those situations. <laughs> so Tom says, all right. He says, I have no idea how Pastor Larry is going to make a sermon out of those two little verses. Well, hang on. <laughs> hang on. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Philippians. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, and you can follow along with me. God tells us, and I'm, I'm talking about in, in terms of general human terms, okay, describing us, speaking of us in a general term. Uh, he makes this statement about uh, us. He says, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. As he thinks within himself, so he is. In other words, our outlook and our attitudes about life and our circumstances are determined how? By how we think. By how we think. Isaiah, speaking of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ, says this of him, quoting, He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yet Jesus possessed a very deep joy. He had a deep joy that was beyond anything that this world could offer. And as he faced the cruel death of Calvary, Jesus said this to his followers, after he fit to the world, he said this to his followers, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. We who have trusted Jesus Christ have the privilege of experiencing the fullness of joy. King David made an interesting statement. He expressed this truth, uh, the way of God as, as how God accomplishes this joy in our lives. Here's what David said. He said, you, Lord, will make known to me the path of life. Here's the key. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. So that means that we have the means and the privilege of experiencing that joy. But you know what? The sad part is many of us don't take advantage of it. Sometimes we look like sour grapes. I'm not saying that life isn't easy. I'm not saying that all the time you're going to be happy. But we do have the means of the privilege of experiencing that joy. We oftentimes, though, do what? We live under a cloud of what? Disappointment. A cloud of discouragement. Instead, we should and could be casting our eyes on the Son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he is the Son and walking in his joy. So my question for you today is, well, how do we live a life that is filled with his meaning and also with his purpose and his joy? Well, I believe the answer is found in a letter that was written centuries and centuries ago. It was written by the Apostle Paul when he was a prisoner in Rome, about 82 or 62 A.D., after the death of Christ. It was sent to his fellow Christians at the uh, church in Philippi, and it was a church that Paul had founded on his very second missionary journey. At least 19 times in the four chapters of this book of Philippians, Paul mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness. So it's an important concept. And it's interesting to notice that Paul's instruction and situation was such that there appeared to be no, as, as Tom pointed out already, there appeared to be no reason for him to be rejoicing whatsoever. Why? Because it indicates that he was a Roman prisoner, as Tom said. In his own rented house, he was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day and was not free to go out and preach to the public. That didn't stop him, though, because he preached to everyone that would come into his place and Oftentimes, that included even the, the household of Caesar. His legal case, though, was coming up very quickly. And he appeared, it appeared to, to, to everybody concerned that he was probably going to face execution. Yet, in spite of his danger and in spite of all the discomfort that he was going through and probably 
maybe do you think he might have been a little apprehensive? Would you be apprehensive in that situation? Yeah. But Paul still overflowed with joy. So how and why? Remember, as the proverb we read earlier stated, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Well, in the book of Philippians, Paul uses that word mind, that mind, ten times, and the word think five times. Add to that all the times that he uses the word remember in there, and you have a total of about 16 references to our mind. In other words, one of the secrets of Christian joy is found where? In the way that we as believers think. It's our mental attitude. Throughout the book of Philippians, Paul is going to explain what kind of mind, and we're going to go through the book of Philippians, but what kind of mind we as believers must have if we're going to be able to experience Christian joy in a world filled with trouble. Do you think that our world is filled with trouble? No? You think it's great? It's not. Obvious, that's an obvious rhetorical question. Of course it's filled with trouble. And even now with the thing with Israel, people are really nervous about what's going to happen. You know, as believers, we don't understand all the details, but as believers, we know that God is still in control of Israel. We know that God is going to bring the Israelites back, that someday He will return in His glory. They will receive Him as their Lord and Savior, and that one day He will reign again on this earth. And Israel will receive all the promised land that he gave as a promise to Abraham. It's coming. I don't know all the details. I'm not going to tell you it's going to happen tonight or tomorrow or whatever. I'm not going to say that. But for us as believers, we don't have to be discouraged. God has a plan. He's not done with that nation yet. We don't know how he's working it out. God also has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And if you trust him, he will work in your life to bring glory to his his own uh, self. So, when we think about this, throughout the book of Philippians, he explains the mind we met. So, I think it's a good book to be studying during this time in our world and what we're going through. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers, and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greeting that he gives to you. Now, who are the senders? Who is the one that sent this letter? Well, have you ever noticed that how someone sends you a letter often says a lot about that person and about where the letter is going and what it's all about? Do you ever notice that in a letter? Now, there is the Dear John type letter. By the way, has anybody here in your life ever received a Dear John letter? Do we have anybody that's ever received one? No? That's pretty cool. Well, a Dear John letter, what's it basically do? It says, I'm ending the relationship. See you later, alligator, I'm out of here. Typically not a real pleasant letter to receive. And then there's the other letter that talks about all that the person that wrote the letter talks about is whom? Themselves. They don't even say anything about you, how you're doing. It's all about themselves and their life without much of an encouragement to the reader whatsoever. Neither of these is the case with this letter to the Philippians from Paul and also by extension to us as well. The text mentions both Paul and Timothy. Paul's the writer of the letter. That's the bottom line. Paul was a Jew. He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, a Gentile environment. He left Tarsus for Jerusalem at some point, and received his formal education in being a great Jew and a great leader in Judaism under the famous teacher by the name of Gamaliel. Do you remember, think back now, this might, for some of us, it's going to be a little bit longer, but do you remember in school, whether grade or high school, whatever it might have been, or possibly college and tech school, thinking at some time in your school situation, why do I have to study that? I will never use this. Anybody here think that? Yeah, whatever it might have been. Why am I studying this? I don't have to use that. Of course, we all have. But there is almost always a time when something you studied 
will prove useful later on down. Now, maybe not all the time, but at least at some point, it might prove useful. Well, that's true. I think also, especially as our lives as believers. It's true in our lives as believers. What do I mean? God will waste nothing. God will waste nothing. He will use your circumstances for His purpose. Whatever it might be, He's going to use it for your, His purpose. I, I just blew me my, my mind about this whole thing with this uh, friend of mine that asked me a year and a half ago to do his funeral. And, you know, I said yes, and then, and then uh, he passed away, and then I went to his visitation and to the funeral and then performed the ceremony. It never even occurred to me that he had this whole thing with my, my nephew's daughter to be able to contact her through this little girl that I met at the funeral. I never even thought about that. God wastes nothing. He will use his circumstances and your circumstances for his purpose in your life. Key in on that. He's working in your heart and your life right now. He has a purpose for you. When God called Paul to be a primary spokesman for the gospel to the Gentiles, Paul's background and connections to the Gentile world, as well as just Jew, his Jewish training, were what? They were all used by God. He had uniquely qualified and prepared Paul to be able to use in the, the role of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his role. For those of us who feel that we are required for whatever reason that you might be going through to endure things that don't seem to be of any value, remember this, God will use it for his glory. God will use it for his glory. Paul mentions Timothy also in the greeting as well. Timothy had a ministry with Paul in Macedonia. He helped Paul establish churches there and in other places as well. Timothy had stuck with Paul through many hardships, but he also learned as well. During a difficult time, Paul sent Timothy to the church at Corinth, and he refers to him as the son whom he loved. It's fairly rare in life that one can find such a good friend and such a trusted companion, but Paul had that in Timothy. That's why you see that endearment in so many of the letters that he wrote. So I want to encourage you also that look around at the people that God has placed in your life and never, never take them for granted or despise what they do in your life or the work. One of the things that we as believers are to do, we're to bear one another's burdens, and we're to encourage and support one another. And many of you are doing that now. Paul invested time in teaching and in training and in being an example to Timothy. And the letters to Timothy are proof of that. Timothy had a love for the Philippians just as Paul did. Often in our lives, more is being caught by our example, isn't this true, by our example than what we teach. Your example is modeling Christ-likeness to people around you. I think it's important for all of us to follow Paul's example and make sure that you are purposely and regularly investing time and thinking about how you can intentionally help other people, what? In their walk with the Lord. That's why we have the body of Christ. And I want to say this, it can't just happen on Sunday morning. It, it, it will be, you can come here to church and you can greet each other and you can say, how are you doing all that? But you know what? If it's only limited to that on Sunday morning, then it's a waste of time. It needs to be happening in our lives throughout the week. So when they have prayer requests, think about them, write them down. Maybe give somebody a call and say, hey, I don't know the whole situation, but I'm just praying for you. Or maybe write them a card or a letter. Whatever it might be, but we need to be intentional in that aspect of reaching out to other people around us. That's what we're called to do. We're called to go and make disciples. Notice that Paul refers also to himself and Timothy as what? Notice the word there in that section, as bond servants. He says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants. The word there in the Greek is douloi, which means a servant or a slave. It's important to study words in the Bible because they're very vital. Not all of them that you have to study, but some of them are. This is an important one. It's interesting to note that in most of Paul's letter, whether he wrote it to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to Timothy, uh, Paul addresses himself as what? An apostle of Jesus Christ. That's the way he greets people, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, which means here's the key. This is so important in studying the Bible. 
that he wanted them to know that he was coming with God's authority. Don't ever forget that. Paul is coming with, you may not always like what he says, you may not always agree with it, but he's coming with God's authority. So maybe the problem isn't with what he said, but maybe it's a problem in my own heart. Does that make sense? Okay. But while he was coming to the Philippians with God's authority, he, he doesn't come up and say, I am God's apostle to you, you better listen. <laughs> he didn't do that. He came as a servant. He came humbly. The term bondservant does what? It implies a willingness and also humility. Paul came willingly and humbly. In the culture in which Paul and Timothy lived, the term servant actually referred to a class of people who were what? They were at the very bottom, the very bottom of the social order. They became slaves, for example, through war, or maybe they, they couldn't pay off a debt, and they, in order to pay it off, they had to become somebody's slave. Uh, or simply they were born as a, as, a, as a mother, I mean, a child of a slave. Their mother was a slave. Slave dealers acquired them, selling them as property, back and forth. They had no rights. They had no privileges. They didn't have any freedom in any sphere of the society outside the family to which they belonged. Strangely, though, it's interesting and history tells us that, research tells you this, some of them were actually what? They were actually doctors. Some were actually accountants. And they were often more educated than their owners. Very intelligent. With that in mind, Paul's coming here now in this letter, and he uses this term here to say that I recognize that Timothy and I are what? We're both owned by someone. Well, guess who owned them? Jesus Christ. That's what they were saying. We, we, are, we are slaves to Jesus Christ. Paul said this, don't you know, and this applies to every one of us in this room who are born again believers, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, do what? Glorify God in your body. That price that was paid was the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ on the cross. That's a truth we all need to remember. And that's why Paul is saying this. Well, who received this letter? Who was it that Paul sent this letter to? Now, notice in the text there, and that's why I encourage you to look at your Bibles, that it's addressed to what? To all the saints. Paul and Timothy say, to all the saints. And he says, including the leaders in the church, the overseers and the deacons. In, in God's terminology... The word saint here refers not to someone who's received a special canonical title, whatever, because some people think he was good enough or she was good enough. No, the word saints here refers to anyone who was born again by receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the word. In all the epistles he writes, he's referring to people who are born again. He also specifically addresses not only the saints, but he also expressly uh, directs the letter to the leaders in the church. He says to the overseers and to the deacons. And as you read through the letters of Paul, especially 1 Timothy, there is a definite order of leadership for the church and qualifications for those leaders. Paul is saying to us what? I consider my life and ministry to be directed to all of them and their progress in the faith. He's going to later say that he prays for them all and that, and that all of them share in the gospel. And he rejoices with every one of them, even those who were causing him strife. He does this, why, in what? In order to attempt to unite the church around Jesus Christ and their common bond to him, as we're going to see later. Paul's example that we should follow embodies God's truth this way. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in what? Does that mean you're always going to agree? No. But it means that under, underneath that, fundamentally, there must be unity. There must be praying. There must be going through that process. But there has to be unity. There, as the song goes, remember the song? There is joy in serving Jesus. Don't know that song, huh? Okay. Anyway, you do that together, okay? There's joy in serving Jesus together. Paul was also able to rejoice in his difficult circumstances 
because they helped strengthen what? His fellowship with other believers. People were praying for him. They were sending him food. They were encouraging him by letters. Paul was encouraged by the, by the faith of others, and it gave him opportunity then to lead others to Jesus Christ. His circumstances were used by God to be able to bring glory to God. So I, I think what we must remember when we think about this is that, that we must remember all the saints. We are the salt and the light of the world. That's what God calls us to be. We have to live and work with people, especially other believers. We can't isolate ourselves and, and still live in a way that glorifies God. Paul's greeting is to all the saints, to you and me. So when we go through the book of Philippians, it not only was written to those people then, it's written to you and me. Take it to that heart and in that context. Lastly, the greeting. What did he actually say? What did he tell them? It's interesting to note that the greeting itself is identical to those found in other, other uh, uh, epistles, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philemon. It includes grace and peace. He says, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you. Two words, grace. It's a favorite word. <laughs> Paul uses grace a lot in his, in his letters. In fact, he uses it over 100 times in his letters. Do you think it was important? Yes, it was. It expresses the unmerited favor of God toward undeserving sinners. That's God's grace. Unmerited favor toward undeserving sinners. It's the same term used in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, you know, by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It expresses the truth that salvation is totally the work of God on behalf of us and doesn't come through any of our human efforts whatsoever, not by works. Paul says grace is that primary motivator in my life for a holy and selfless life. It was grace that turned Paul around. It was grace that take the, took the, the greatest legalist. He was the greatest legalist. He was the greatest debater and one of the greatest persecutors of the Christian faith at that time, turned him around into one of the greatest advocates for the love and the mercy of God. He loved Jesus. He told the Corinthians, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. In other words, he says, God has shown me his grace, and I am not going to let my life be wasted. I'm going to show the world that I love Jesus, and I'm going to go through my life serving and loving him according to his purposes. May we remember God's grace in our own lives as well. And, and, and here's the key. Live so it's not vain. Live so it's not empty. Live with a life filled with his purpose and joy. And the second thing that he talks about is peace. Grace and peace. They go together. Paul indicates that peace is a result of the grace that he first mentioned. Each of us must realize that there, there can be no peace. There can be no peace in our heart, no sense of well-being or wholeness and tranquility, even in the storms of life, until we have entered into the grace of God by faith. We must have first peace, what? With God. We must have first peace with God in order to have the peace of God. And I've talked about that before. When we think about this, Paul says that this grace and peace aren't from him, but from our God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them are the authors of grace and peace for you and me as believers. Paul's going to later, as we get into the letters, encourage the, the uh, people there, but also all of us, that this truth, that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will do what? will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So as we think about and as we get into this book, this greeting is to people to try to encourage them to listen to what he's going to be saying about how your life can be filled with joy, about how you can live your life for Christ and what God wants you to be doing. His greeting, don't think of it just as a letter that was to an old church back in the, the, the Philippians area. No, it's to you and me as well. And it applies to us in our lives today in very powerful ways. So I'm going to challenge you. May we study this letter written to us. And I'm going to encourage you to be going through the book of Philippians. Read it through several times. Study it. May it encourage us as we have this letter written to, this, to us to do this. We are who we are because of God's grace. And we should all strive to be what? Servants. For the sake of Jesus, just like Paul and Timothy. Father, we pray that as we look to your letter, we thank you for this greeting. It's deep and rich. We thank you that it was not only to the saints back then, but it's also to us here at Lorraine Community Church. 
And Father, as we study this book of Philippians, may we, may we take it to our own heart. May we not just say, I'm going to read it, but I, may we say, Lord, would you apply this to my life? Would you infuse your word into my heart so that I might truly bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and that truly I might have a life filled with joy in the midst of our troubled world? People around me, Lord, need to know about Jesus. They need to know about his love, and they're only going to see it through me. And may I be willing to not only show the love of Christ, but also to tell of the love of Christ to others around us. May that be our heart as we go through this study. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you would stand with me, we are going to now sing a, our closing hymn, uh, How Great Thou Art. How Great Thou Isn't he great? <laughs> He is. He is so awesome. Beyond what we can comprehend or think. How great thou art. Amen. Father, we thank you. You are indeed great. And we can't even comprehend or even describe the greatness that you extend to us through your mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful for it. And I just pray now, Lord, that you would help us to learn to begin how to experience joy in our lives 
As we go through this life of difficulty and troubles and trials, may we show the light of Christ to those around us. In his name we pray. Amen. Have a good week in the Lord. Oh, cookie. Don't forget the cookies. Ha, ha, ha.